All right, continuing with chapter 5 called Rome and the Rise of Christianity, I want to reiterate the fact that the reason why we study Rome is because of their huge impact to the world. And remember, this is the empire that became the largest and most powerful empire in history up to this point. All right, section two is called From the Republic to an Empire. So you can see that the government is going to evolve from a republic to an empire. And we're going to talk about how that happened. Section two talks about how the plebeians and the patricians were continually unequal. And it caused a lot of issues in ancient Rome. And the Senate is the one that really became the true power in Rome, not the elected councils or the elected tribunes, but it was really, in essence, the Senate that was running everything because the Senate were most, mostly aristocrats or upper class. Um, once they were elected as a senator, they were a senator for life. They were in charge of directing the wars, and they also decided to take charge of not only domestic policies, but foreign policies, and that included the financial affairs of the Roman Republic. However, the small farmers were still the crucial portion to ancient Rome because of the fact that they were part of the army. Um, and because the poor or the plebeians were unable to compete with the upper class or patricians, they became known as the landless poor because they would lose their land to the wealthy because they could no longer either farm it or pay for the taxes. So there were two brothers that came along that were going to try to try, that were going to try to change this and they were the Gracchus brothers and these were elected plebeians or tribunes and Tiberius Gracchus and Gaius Gracchus both passed land reform bills that gave that land back to the poor so that there was a little bit more equality. Obviously, this was going to infuriate the senators, especially the ones that were the rich landowners. And so because of that, what you're going to see is a theme that continues throughout this chapter, or at least this section, that if you upset the Senate, who was the most powerful group in ancient Rome, you would probably find yourself dead. And that's exactly what happened to Tiberius in 133 BC. And later on, um, his brother Gaius was also killed by the Senate. All right, now we, we're going to talk about how the role of the army really changed what happened in ancient Rome. Marius was a Roman general that started to recruit soldiers and promised to give them land. And so in essence, he was bribing them to be part of his, his Roman army. And that made these soldiers very loyal to Marius, but not so loyal to the ideals of Rome and the betterment of Rome. And so this is the first time that the army was not under the government control. And of course, that troubled the Senate. So the Senate gave Lucius Cornelius Sulla command of an army in Asia Minor with the hopes that um, he could defeat Marius. And there was a civil war between Marius and his armies and Sulla and his armies, and Sulla won. And um, at this point, then Sulla took control over Rome because, of course, he, he had proven his power. Um, however, he was um, supposed to be the leader for only six months, uh, but he ended up being a dictator for two years. And he did things like um, killing anyone that opposed anything he had to say or do. And, of course, he was not one of Rome's greatest leaders. It was at this point that, of course, it was clear that the Republic was no longer going to exist because Sulla was in charge of Rome as one person versus having the two consuls and the Senate ruling. And so over the next 50 years, there were many civil wars and various leaders that took over Rome's control. And so in 60 BC, they established the first triumvirate. And a triumvirate, based by its name, if you look at the prefix, tri, of course, meaning three, a triumvirate was a government led by three people. And these three people were to have equal power. 
And remember, this comes from the ideas of the republic of not wanting to have um, rule, be ruled by a king or a queen. And so they always wanted to have multiple people controlling their government. That's why they elected two councils, and now they have a triumvirate. In the first triumvirate, the members of the first triumvirate were Pompey, and Pompey had military control in Spain, and so of course he proved his powers um, through military success. And Crassus, um, Crassus was in the military as well, but mostly just because he was an upper class. He was actually the richest man in Rome, and so of course he had a lot of power due to that. So he took command in Syria, and unfortunately he was killed a short time later in 53 BC. Now the third member of the triumvirate, and probably the most power, powerful, was Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar had military control in Gaul, which is present-day France, and he had many, many successes in the military. As a matter of fact, one of his victories in Asia Minor, he said the famous quote, Vini Vidi Vici, which is Latin, meaning I came, I saw, I conquered. And so that is a contribution today as well. Maybe not the Latin version, but definitely the English version. So let's take a look at your maps again on the last page in your packets. In section one, we labeled Italy. We lab labeled the city of Rome, the Tiber River, which Rome is on, the Mediterranean Sea, the city of Carthage, which of course was significant in the Punic Wars, the northern portion of, of Africa, which was then the province, the Roman province called Africa, the Alps Mountains, which protected the Italian peninsula, the island of Sicily, Rome's first province, Spain, another province Rome acquired, Macedonia, and Greece, two other European provinces that Rome controlled. The first Asian province was in Pergamum, and now we're going to label Gaul because Rome controlled Gaul or parts of Gaul as well because of what Julius Caesar did. All right, so the senators voted to have Pompey rule the government alone and told Caesar to give up his command. Clearly the Senate was seeing that Caesar was very powerful with his military strength and they wanted him out because they were fearful for their own power. Caesar knew something was up and so he refused to give up his command of his army and he decided to march into Italy and at this point it virtually started another civil war and once he crossed the Rubicon River he knew there was no turning back and so the quote crossing the Rubicon is one of the contributions meaning um, you've, you're at a point beyond any return and that's what crossing the Rubicon means. So Caesar went into Italy defeated Pompey and his army and Caesar was named the dictator of Rome in 45 BC. Third and fourth hour study halls will be meeting in the media. All right, as we ended section two, part one, we were talking about the first triumvirate of Pompey, Crassus, and Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar then eventually became the dictator of Rome in 45 BC and he was a very good leader as a matter of fact the word dictator meaning absolute leader um, today's version of that term means that it's negative and in his day it really wasn't um, he did a lot of good things like gave land back to the poor he increased the number of senators from 500 to, f to 900 and of course that um, seemed like it gave more people power, but he knew in essence the more people in the Senate, the more that they would argue. So really it would take away power from them. Um, he constructed or had a lot of buildings um, done or constructed, um, and he, invent he had military adventures to the east. However, his rule came to an end abruptly on the Ides of March. The Ides of March was on March 15th, 44 BC, and this is when Julius Caesar was assassinated by a group of senators that were really led by Marcus Brutus and Gaius Cassius. Um, now, Caesar's assassination is kind of um, famous because it was so brutal. It was so, um, you know, it, it was just violent, as most of the things that happened in Rome actually was. Um, this assassination led by Brutus and Cassius um, really kind of caught Caesar off guard because he wasn't anticipating at all. 
Um, now, the reason why they wanted to assassinate him is because he was getting too powerful. And they thought that the Senate would basically disappear in their power, and of course they didn't want to end their power. And so the people wanted Caesar to become king, and they offered the throne to him, or the crown to him, three different times, and every time he turned it down, people were even more um, loving of Caesar, and so that's why he was assassinated. Now, one thing we got from Julius Caesar, besides the saying of crossing the Rubicon, was the Julian calendar. And that was one thing that Caesar had changed for Rome, and one of the months he added, of course, was called July, named after himself. After Caesar's assassination, there was a struggle for power. And again, nobody was chosen, and the Senate had done that, and there was a lot of chaos going on in Rome. Um, so at this partic particular time, there was a second triumvirate that took over. And one of the people in the second triumvirate was Octavian. And Octavian was actually the heir for Caesar's leadership, and he was his grandnephew. Um, eventually, he did rule just over the western part of the Roman Republic, but not right at this point. Second person in the triumvirate was Mark Antony, and he was an ally of Caesar and one of his assistants. And eventually, he took over the eastern part of the Roman Republic, which we'll talk about later. And the third person, because you need three people in a triumvirate, was Lepidus. And Lepidus was chosen because he was the commander of Caesar's cavalry. And of course, all three of these people were connected to Caesar, and they wanted to make sure that um, Marcus Brutus and Gaius Cassius and their people wouldn't rule Rome. Now, there was basically a conflict between Octavian and Mark Antony. That was it. Lepidus really um, didn't have a whole lot of power, and eventually he was forced to leave Rome. And um, when he did that, he kind of lived the rest of his life in exile until 88 BC. Um, but Antony and Octavian kind of were vying for power, and Mark Antony joined forces with Queen, queen Cleopatra. And, of course, Queen Cleopatra, being the queen of Egypt, wanted Egypt to gain the power that they once had in their ancient kingdom. And so she had actually um, kind of conspired with Caesar as well, and rumors had it that they had a little love affair going. Um, but, of course, that didn't work out so well once Caesar was assassinated. So she kind of latched on to Mark Antony. And there was a battle of Octavian's forces and Mark Antony and Cleopatra's forces in 31 BC called the Battle of Actium, which was in Greece. Octavian had really very little problem defeating the army and the navies of Antony and Cleopatra. And eventually they both fled this battle area and they committed suicide. As a matter of fact, there is a quote on page 158 that says, Anthony was the first to commit suicide by the sword. Cleopatra threw herself at Octavian's feet and tried her best to attract his gaze in vain for his self-control enabled him to ignore her beauty. It was not her life she was after, but a portion of the kingdom. When she realized that this was hopeless, she took advantage of her guard's carelessness to get herself into the royal tomb. Once there, she put on the royal robes, lay down in a richly perfumed coffin beside her Antony, and then she applied poisonous snakes to her veins and passed to death as through into a sleep. And so the poisonous asps were the downfall to Cleopatra. So at this point, Octavian didn't have anybody to fight him, and Octavian became the sole ruler of Rome at the ripe young age of 32, and he ruled from 31 BC until 14 AD, and this time period was called the Age of Augustus. And the reason why it was called Age of Augustus is because Octavian was renamed that. Now, the Age of Augustus was a time period where Octavian knew that he needed to try to restore the government, which was the Republic at the time, but knew it could not be completely restored. So in 27 BC, Octavian became Rome's first emperor, and the Senate gave him the title of Augustus. And this is meaning the revered one. He also took on the name of Caesar, meaning first citizen. And so his new name was Caesar Augustus. And as a matter of fact, any emperor after Caesar Augustus 
also took on the title of Caesar, of course, named after Julius Caesar. And so it, it kind of refers to um, as a leader or um, later on in the Byzantium Empire, they used czar, for example. So on our Greece versus Rome comparison charts, we already labeled that ancient Greece's government was a direct democracy. We also labeled that Rome's government was a republic. However, now you can see that it has evolved into an empire. All right. Caesar Augustus was very popular. However, he also knew that most of his power and control came from his control over his army. And he was the commander in chief because he was in charge of the government and the army. And that word is an imperator, which is commander in chief. And that is where we get our English word meaning emperor. It comes from the word imperator. All right, so Caesar Augustus was in control of all of the military. He controlled about 28 legions, which accompanied, or which was about 150,000 men and about 5,000 troops. And so the legions of about 5,000 troops were um, kind of the instrument of the Roman army. And the people that were in these legions were called legionnaires. He also was in charge of 130,000 auxiliary forces. He also had a Praetorian Guard of 9,000 men, which their job was to specifically just guard the Emperor. And that's a picture of what the Praetorian Guards look like. Now, although Augustus was very powerful, he conquered a lot of new areas. He made sure that Rome was kind of back to that stable power that it once was in the Mediterranean world. Um, he could not conquer the Germanic tribes of Germany. And it was this little dose of reality that made sure that Augustus knew that although they were very powerful, they weren't, you know, limitless. They, they weren't um, able to conquer anyone and everyone. And one other thing from Caesar Augustus that we got was, of course, the month of August was named after Augustus. All right, the early empire um, was, of course, beginning with Augustus, but when he dies in 14 AD, um, there was a new time period that existed until 180 AD. The emperors at this point in time really tried to emulate what Augustus did, but they really became very corrupt and they really didn't do a very good job. So the early emperors um, during this time period were classified as Julio-Claudian dynasty members. And that just meant that they were related either to Augustus or his wife Livia or their families. So the first Julio-Claudian dynasty emperor was Tiberius. Tiberius was Augustus's stepson, and he was very good in the military. And so he was somebody that they definitely looked up to because of his relationship and family ties to Augustus. And the thought here is if you're related to a good leader, you too would be a good leader. But most of the Julio-Claudian dynasty members were really not very good. Um, as a matter of fact, Tiberius was very... Um, reclusive and um, he ended up fleeing Rome because he just didn't feel like he had control and he left Rome without any sort of leader and so there was some issues there. Um, the next ruler of the Julio-Claudian dynasty was Caligula and Caligula was Tiberius's adopted grandson and Cal Caligula was um, okay for the first couple years that he ruled, but then he really started to become power hungry, um, extravagant. Um, he was considered to be a little bit insane, so to speak, um, because he um, was slightly deaf and he had a limp due to illness, so he was a little odd anyway, but he was cruel and he was wild and eventually he was assassinated and mostly because of things like this. Um, there's a story that says that Caligula was telling the Senate that they had absolutely no power whatsoever and he said, you know what, that you guys have such little power in the government, it's all me, that I could name my horse to the Senate and he could become a senator and be just as powerful as you. And of course he did that and he was then assassinated. The next Julio-Claudian dynasty member was Claudius, and Claudius was really probably one of the 
more positive of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, and he acquired Britain to the empire, which was a huge feat because, of course, it was across the English Channel, and it wasn't part of the continental Europe that Rome was controlling at this point in time. And the final Julio-Claudian dynasty member was Nero, um, and Nero was adopted by his great uncle Claudius, the previous leader, um, and he too was not very um, with it, let's just say. He was a little off his rocker. Um, he was so mean and cruel that he even had his own mother killed. Um, the two things that Nero was known for is one, that there was a fire in Rome during his rule. Some say he started it. Um, some say he didn't do anything to stop it. Um, and of course, then he blamed the Christians on the fire. The other thing was, from the picture down below here, he had a statue of himself built near the Flavian Amphitheater. And the Flavian Amphitheater, of course, today is known as the Colosseum simply because the Colossus, or a large statue of Nero, existed outside of this amphitheater. And the, even though the statue or Colossus doesn't exist today, of course, this Colosseum does. And as expected, Nero ended up committing suicide. It was probably either that or he was going to be um, assassinated. All right, so on our maps, go ahead. We already have all of these places labeled. And the new place that we need to label is, of course, Britain, which is the island up here, which was acquired by Claudius. All right, the next leaders were called the good emperors. And these good emperors were not called good because they were necessarily good leaders, but they were chosen by an adoptive system. And this was started by Nerva. And Nerva was the one that decided, you know what, let's not have our children or family members rule because just because you're related to somebody that is really intelligent and is a good leader doesn't automatically make you a good leader. So you have Nerva who started this new system or adoptive system where they would literally adopt someone that was qualified and call them their son so they could rule. Um, the second of the good emperors was Trajan, and we'll talk about him in a later slide. Hadrian came next, and again, we will talk about him in another slide. Antonius Pius, um, he too um, will mention, but his big push um, from 138 to 161 was that he promoted art and science. Um, he also had construction of public works, legal reform, and new provisions for orphans. And the final person of the good emperor was Marcus Aurelius. And unfortunately, because he didn't follow this adoptive system and he chose his son Commodus to rule instead of selecting somebody that was qualified, it brought down the end of the Pax Romana, or the 200 years of peace. Chapter 5, Section 2, Part 3. When we ended Last time we were talking about the five good emperors, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antonius Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. And those five good emperors were part of the Pax Romana. The Pax Romana was, means literally in Latin, Roman peace. And it was approximately 200 years where Rome was maybe acquiring new lands, but didn't have to defend themselves. Um, they created new programs to help all of the poor because as their population was acquiring, they also were acquiring you know, more poor. Um, they started building projects like aqueducts, bridges, and roads, connecting the entire empire together. And so you need to know the dates of 27 BC to 180 AD. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about those good emperors and give you a little bit more detail. Um, Trajan, the second of the good emperors, was the leader of Rome when Rome was at its height, when it was at its largest point in history. And that was at 116 AD. And so um, Hadrian, or Trajan added Dacia, which is present-day Romania, added in Mesopotamia, but unfortunately they also lost Mesopotamia um, before he died in 117. And he also acquired lands in the Sinai Peninsula. So those will be places that you'll need to label on the map as well. Um, the picture on the right is a statue of Trajan, 
and the other two pictures are of Trajan's column found in present-day Rome. Um, the one on the left is the full picture of Trajan's column, and the one in the center gives you more of a, a detailed picture of the intricacies, and it tells the story during Tra Trajan's rule on it. All right, so our map, we needed to add Dacia and Sinai Peninsula. We already have all of these locations on the map. So Dacia, or present-day Romania, is located there. And the Sinai Peninsula is, of course, part of modern-day Egypt. All right, the next of the good emperors that we're going to elaborate on is Hadrian. And Hadrian, his claim to fame is that he knew we didn't need to add any more land, but we needed to protect what we already had for the Roman Empire. And so he made sure that um, he strengthened the borders connecting the Rhine and the Danube, Danube rivers in continental Europe, but then he also built a defensive wall in Britain. And he built that, um, or it started the construction in 122 AD, and that was basically to keep the Scots from the northern part of the island um, out of the Roman Empire because they kind of were, um, you know, just kind of pesky enemies and they kept trying to enter Britain and acquire Britain and, and have Rome lose it. So during the height of the Roman Empire, the land encompassed three different continents. It covered three and a half million square miles and they had a population of over 50 million people. How can you make three and a half million square miles that encompass three different continents, a lot of different ethnic groups under one rule. Well, they had to do that by trying to create unity. And so they did that by allowing local groups to maintain their own customs, religions, even allow them to govern themselves. There was also a lot of citizenship that was granted. And in 212 AD, the emperor Caracalla gave citizenship to every free person in the Roman Empire. Of course, that did not mean slaves, um, it did not mean women, but anybody that was a free man in Rome was granted citizenship. They also used um, universal languages, and in the western part of the empire they used Latin as their universal language, and in the east they used Greek. Because of this, um, they combined the Greek and the Roman cultures, especially when it came to um, architecture, styles of military, those sorts of things. That is called Greco-Roman because it's a blend of Greek and Roman culture and ideas. All right, so on our chart comparing Greece to ancient Rome, um, ancient Greece, of course, anything dealing that we study about ancient Greece is called Greek. Anything we study about ancient Rome is called Roman, and when you blend it together, it is called Greco-Roman. Another way that they unified this large empire encompassing three continents was making sure that the cities um, were all set up very similarly. Every city would have a forum where the government would take place. Every city would have um, Roman baths. Every city would have an amphitheater or an arena for entertainment purposes. Um, they all had very similar setup, and so this spread a lot of the culture throughout the entire Roman Empire by making sure that all of these cities in this empire was set up similarly. All right, so we have this large empire. What was it like? Um, during the Pax Romana, things were very peaceful and Rome prospered greatly. And so trading increased because you weren't worried about trading. Um, during war times, they, they just didn't trade very much because, of course, it was dangerous. So they used roads that were already constructed and they linked China to the Roman Empire by using the Royal Road and they also brought in grains from Egypt, and so that allowed them to, of course, feed their over 50 million people. Farming, however, was still a mainstay for the Roman people, and um, most people were still farmers, and the small farms really were mostly in northern Italy, and those were called latifundia. Latifundias are large landed estates. I would equate it to southern plantations here in the United States. Um, 
those plantations they used slave labor and you know they farmed perhaps different things than they did in ancient Rome but here they did mostly um, animals and again there was still a huge difference between the rich class and the poor class and that caused a lot of issues lots and lots of unemployment mostly because of the large number of slaves because remember slaves were about a fourth of the Roman population so when 25 percent of your population are slaves that will work for free you really don't have a lot of openings for jobs so unemployment was very high especially in the city of Rome and many people in the city of Rome relied on the free grain that they got from the emperors all right so but finishing up section two, let's go ahead and review some main ideas. The government that was by three people with equal power, again, look at the prefix of tri, that's a triumvirate. An absolute ruler is a dictator, and um, that is probably a different meaning today. Number three, military unit of about 5,000 troops is a legion. An imperator is a commander in chief, and it's where we get the word emperor from and Rome's first emperor was Octavian and he changed his name to Caesar Augustus. Number six, the Pax Romana was A, a period of peace and prosperity beginning in 96 AD. Hadrian's Wall was a defense against what group of people? Scots. Large landed estates in Italy were called B, Latifundia. Augustus's new political system allowed emperors to choose their successors. They made sure that they chose qualified people, not just um, people who were related to them. And all of the following are true except which one? A. Most Romans also spoke Greek. That was only done.